I'm Nelson Davis, executive producer of Making It. There are certain images that are indelibly etched into the collective consciousness of America. Disturbing images that we would rather forget. The assassination of President John F. Kennedy, explosion of the Space Shuttle Challenger, and agonizing pictures of the twin towers of the World Trade Center that we now refer to as 9-11. The aftermath of that tragedy trickled all the way down into the small business community, affecting many in adverse ways. But there were some entrepreneurs whose services became more valuable under the threat of increased terrorism. And we'll take a look at two of those businesses today on Making It. Making It Minority Success Stories. Inspiring personal stories of struggle, triumph, and success from America's small business community. Welcome to Making It. I'm Lynette Romero. And I'm Emmett Miller. Well, things have changed for entrepreneur Ni Ling Wacker since Making It first visited her 15 years ago. The software company she founded was just beginning. Her vision was to develop and sell document imaging software internationally to set industry standards worldwide for the electronic storage of paper records. The tragedy of 9-11 combined with corporate scandals caused problems throughout the whole American economy. But Ni Ling's company, Laserfish, actually prospered. In the wake of terrorist threats of computer espionage, the U.S. government introduced new tougher standards for the storage of crucial files. Laserfish was certified by the government to be in compliance with its strict security needs. Today, the company holds contracts with the five branches of the U.S. military, the Secret Service, the FBI, and the State Department. Here's how it all began. Where would you like to see CompuLink be in, say, five years? I would look ourselves a, a, a multi-center you know, national company. I would like to start concentrate, first concentrate in Southern California and New York area, and hopefully internationally. It was 1989, and Ni Ling Wacker's software company CompuLink was in its infancy when making it first visited. Today, not only has the company's name changed, so has its location. And as Ni Ling predicted, they've gone global. There's a lot of changing since last time uh, you were here. Uh, what we have done is over the past uh, years, and we have grown about steadily 30% uh, every year. And our people, you know, we, at that time we probably have about, what, around 10 people. Now we have over 155 people here. On top of that, our reseller channel grows to about almost a thousand resellers uh, companies. Uh, they are independent business people. So we have um, uh, over 20,000 customers worldwide. So this is quite of a, a growth. Much of the recent growth is a result of corporate scandals and new government mandates forcing companies to comply with federal archiving standards. The last uh, few years with uh, the challenging on the, you know, the SECs in the financial marketplace, a lot of uh, organizations need to make sure their records uh, have the records integrity. There's a lot of compliance issues here. And uh, we being, as a company, as a records management company, we actually help the corporations when they want to make sure they meet the compliances, and our product help them actually of a lot of ways. So actually, it helps our business. And where some companies were hit hard by 9-11, the heightened security that resulted actually bolstered business for Laserfish. Yeah, 9-11 is a very sad for, you know, United States and uh, terrorist uh, attackings and everything else. So people are much more security conscious and uh, they also want to make sure records are preserved. And our product being a DOD 5015.2, you know, certify, it helps the companies or organizations to make sure if they want to uh, having a security and uh, preserve the records and our product actually help them. Our goal is always uh, customer centric and to making money was not a major issue in our issue. We want to provide a product which our customer want 
Aside from taking care of customers, Ni Ling says it's imperative to nurture employees. People are the most important aspect of any organization, especially our organization. So what we want to make sure is not, you know, in a, this busy business world, we are taking care of ourselves, our people. And uh, so we actually have a, a lunch program, which enables people to spend a lunch hour to exchange ideas. Different people touch bases with, uh, you know, the different aspect of the work. I believe if you taking care of the people who uh, looks after the business, actually they will look after you. Two employees who look after the business are also family. Neeling's husband, Chris, is senior vice president of sales and marketing. Her son, Tom, is director of marketing. In fact, Tom is the reason Neeling launched the company in the first place. My son got very sick and uh, I had to quit my job and quit my PhD program and actually stay at uh, home. And that's actually how I start the business. And uh, now he works for us as uh, the director of marketing and is a really a very, uh, lend a lot of a helping hand to the business. Together, they tackle the day-to-day -day challenges of operating a multi-million dollar company in a rapidly changing market. I think the challenge to own a high-tech or software company in the 21st century is the how do you create a harmonious environment, a great product in a very fast-changing world. Basically, our world changing so fast. It's like your floor is moving continuously. And in 18 years of business, Neeling admits she's made some mistakes along the way. One of the mistakes I made is in the early days, I launched LaserFish. You try to listen too many people tell you what to do and you want to get more higher market share. And uh, you finally realize you cannot be any, everything to everybody. We, a, very, a, a company, try to be very efficient to help people to run smarter. And I think that's really what boils down to if you really help your people, help your customers. And speaking of customers, she now has thousands of customers. Laserfish is currently installed in 39 countries on nearly every continent. They include Saudi Arabia's social security system and Mexico's Department of Immigration. And as you saw in the story, Neeling values her employees so much, she serves them a daily free lunch. That could be one of the factors in her company's explosive growth, as a matter of fact. Dr. Noel Nelson, author of The Power of Appreciation, says acts exactly like that are the key in today's Secrets of Success. Appreciation is more than gratitude. Appreciation is an actual force. It's an energy that you can harness to attract to you more customers, better sales, or whatever it is that spells success in your business. Now, in our book, The Power of Appreciation, we describe the five steps to getting there. But the most important step of all is to appreciate what you've got to get what you want. Find reasons to value and be grateful for your current customers because that sets up an energetic dynamic which attracts new customers. It's scientific. Like attracts like. Even if you have a sort of clunky customer and you don't know how to appreciate them, try to find the value in that customer because surely there is something to be grateful for. And the more that you appreciate whatever is going on in your business right here and right now, the more you will attract good things to appreciate tomorrow. Appreciation really is a win-win. Words worth following from Dr. Noel Nelson. And you can contact her at www.dr.noelnelson.com. And you can find more Secrets of Success as well as order a videotaped copy of today's show. It's at our website, www.makingatv.com. And coming up next, governments talking Turkey in Arabic and Farsi. 9-11 brought them all to the table, but who can speak their languages? Arlene Thomas's company can, and you'll meet her when we return. Honoring the men and women of America's small business communities, Making It is being brought to you by The Boeing Company and by Southern California Edison for over 100 years, life powered by Edison. Welcome back to Making It. We as a nation, as a planet, were deeply saddened by the disaster of 9-11. We grieved on many levels. 
But you know the old saying, you wake up one day and you realize life goes on. It's time to get back to business as usual. But what, in a world that has been forever changed from the world we used to know, is business as usual? Today we're talking to entrepreneurs who provide services desperately needed in the wake of 9-11. In an era of increasing global tensions and hostilities, there's little room for error due to cultural misunderstandings or language barriers. And now, the government urgently needed translators of regional dialects in Afghanistan, Iraq, other Arabic nations as well. The call went out, and Arlene Thomas answered. She's the owner of TCS Translations. It's a company whose clients include the federal government and the private sector. On a daily basis, her company can translate emails into Japanese, produce corporate manuals in Spanish, or create confidential government documents in Farsi. And as she tells correspondent Errol Smith, there's a lot more to communication than just language. Aline, give us a sense of why translating is not just a matter of substituting a word in one language for a word in another language. Well, human speech is very complicated. Um, we all know I, that communication, 80 percent, is, is nonverbal. Um, it's not the actual words coming out of your mouth. It's the actual, uh, the hymns and the haws and the intonation, um, the insinuation with your voice. Uh, so if you are merely translating words, um, you're not getting the, the syntax and the, the meaning behind it in order to really know what the person was speaking about. Because, you know, just like in, in, in English we use words like dude and, you know, Spanish, you say dude by saying ox, and if you're talking about oxen, all of a sudden when you're really talking about people, obviously there's going to be a problem. You're not just translating language, you have to translate cultures and dialects. How do you find people who can do that and do it accurately? We find the people by basically maintaining good relationships with um, people within the translation community nationally as well as within different cultural communities. So by establishing um, relationships with uh, different cultural organizations, um, professionals in various fields, uh, because as well as translation, we also have a lot of um, expertise in different fields that is required at some time. So sometimes we need a translator who might know some engineering. We pre-screen everyone very carefully. Um, we believe a lot in doing the team effort translation uh, because it's not only important to have a native in the other foreign language who is near native in English, it's also important to have the opposite where you have a native English speaker. Uh, with near native understanding and ability in the further, f other foreign language. And um, that's where you basically come up with the best final product. Um, we also have uh, basically kind of a senior revisionist who does quality control procedures that we've set up over time. Now, after 9-11, the federal government was on the lookout for Arabic translators. And how did that impact your business? We got more work in the continental United States as well as outside of the United States. So we have increased need for overseas translation by both U.S. citizens and U.S. residents. For all of our languages, including Arabic um, and, uh, and Pashti, which is an, also another language that we are looking for a lot due to the Afghanistan um, situation. Security is critical. How do you ensure it? Well, the government has its own security requirements. and. Uh, Basically, our facility here was built to ensure um, security. So we're dealing with classified documentation. No matter where in the country we're working, we are either at a secured government facility or uh, we bring the work here where it's done in a secured environment um, where we have assured um, that through different you know, technological as well as human proof um, systems that security is being maintained. Your work is so sensitive and requires so much expertise. How did you get your foot in the door with big government agencies to begin with? I um, started doing translations myself as um, a Spanish-English translator. Um, and I realized um, once I was in the industry what there was a need for and what there was a lack of. And where did you get the seed money to start the company? The seed money uh, to start the company is uh, Basically, personal credit cards and uh, creative financing, um, so to speak. And uh, also, basically, it was a constant and still is um, revolution of reinvesting back into the company in order to achieve growth. Um, so for a few years, you know, not compensating myself entirely just to make sure that the company would have enough um, funds and resources in order to keep on going. 
You know, Arlene, every company suffers setbacks. I'm sure you've had yours. When you run into them, how do you deal with them? Basically, you take a deep breath, and uh, you never count on just one client or one job or one operation. You are always um, looking to develop other capabilities. Personal question. You have a global business, and you have three kids. How do you manage? Well, I always said I couldn't do it with you know, without them. So um, they're my inspiration. It's, it's, uh, it's a matter of being very fluid in, in both in business and in your personal life. And, um, you know, at first being a mom, I was worried that my clients would say, oh, you know, well, she's got other priorities. Um, and, uh, and I heard back from, from a couple of clients, you know, when my children were still babies and saying, well, we knew that you would get it done even if it was at 2 a.m. because you always send us those faxes at 2 and 3 in the morning and on weekends. And I thought, well, that's a new perspective. Complicated issue for them to get so correct. Yeah, I'm kidding. That's, that's, that's amazing. TCS has approximately 500 translators, both staff and contract. They can interpret 200 different languages and dialects, which is absolutely incredible. Arlene expects to nearly double the company's revenues next year from 3 to $5 million. Wow. The CEOs you've met on today's show happen to be women, and so is our studio guest. Christine Closer, she's the founder of the Network for Empowering Women, and she has some tips that can help all entrepreneurs right after this break. Okay, so here's how you can get in touch with the entrepreneurs on today's show. You can contact Neeling Wacker at Laserfiche, the number there, 800-985-8533. And you can reach Arlene Thomas at TCS Translations by logging on to her website, www.tcstranslations.com. And now, let's join Lynette in the studio with our guest, Christine Closer. Thanks, Emmett. Christine is the founder of the Network for Empowering Women. The organization helps educate and inspire entrepreneurs to start or expand their businesses. Welcome to Making It. We're glad you're here with us. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you. First of all, let's talk right about networking for empowering women. What does that mean? Why is that so important? It is so important because women are natural networkers and so much of their growth in their business comes from knowing other people and partly knowing other people and also being known. A lot of people say it's about who you know, mm -hmm. and I have a different philosophy. I think it's a little bit more in the networking world about who knows you. So we create experiences for women to network and meet each other and get educated and inspired to really succeed in all areas of life. So it really is about conversation and talking, getting to know people, having them know you. It's a, you think it, you're just making conversation, but it's really something very important. Absolutely. And the most important thing, I think, in networking is finding out about the other person, developing that relationship and interest, really listening to them. Let's talk about the two CEOs that we've seen in the program so mm -hmm. far. They're both women. They have kids. They're juggling family, being moms, also being entrepreneurs. How do you balance all of that? You take a lot of deep <laughs> breaths. <laughs> but one of the techniques that I use that I really recommend highly is to make sure that every day, both in the morning and in the evening, that you take some time just for yourself, perhaps journaling, writing in a gr you know, gratitude list or in you know, silent meditation or prayer, whatever resonates with that person, but some quiet time, both as the day starts and as the day wraps up. I can't imagine, I mean, I'm going to have a baby soon, and I can't imagine trying to do all of that, and that would be the first thing that you forget, the time for yourself, and you really yeah. have to strengthen yourself. That's yeah. where your power is, right? And sometimes it only takes five minutes. Uh -huh. I mean, it can be that quick. That simple, huh? Yeah. Okay, um, female friendships. You kind of talked about that a little bit in that mm -hmm. we're, we're just talking with each other and developing our strengths. Let's talk about how important those female friendships are. To me, they're everything. Because when you're a businesswoman, you have a tendency to eat, drink, sleep, walk, talk. Like, everything is business. And it's so important to have other women that you can go to. You know, just go out and have coffee, have tea, take a walk. And talk more about you mm -hmm. rather than business all the time. Really, like, have your soul be nurtured and really be fulfilled by having that juice mm -hmm. that kind of happens when women come together purely for the sake of enjoyment. And so then does that then lead to talking about business and talking about endeavors and things like that? Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. I think it's just really important to have a place that you can go talk to someone mm -hmm. and be loved no matter whether you succeeded or failed or got to your to-do list or didn't or got that deal or didn't get the deal. Just someone who's always there who really loves you. And sometimes it can't always be your 
you know, romantic partner. Sometimes, right. it, you, sometimes you need some other sources. Right. Now, some people might think that sounds really great. It's kind of warm and fuzzy. But how does that really get us into business and really empowering ourselves as business people and entrepreneurs? It empowers us as women. And as women is where we succeed the most, when we're really feeling great about ourselves and confident and powerful in our own lives, it kind of trickles out and reaches into our business life. So this is kind of along the same lines. It really is about mindset and where you are and where your strength is, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. We talked talk a little bit that? earlier about, mm -hmm. you know, we all know people who are in the same business mm -hmm. and one succeeds and one fails. And like, what's the difference? They both have the same product or the same service. And it's in the mindset. Oftentimes you'll see people in the same situation and one will be positive and optimistic. They just know that things are going to happen. They feel good. You know, they say nice things to themselves and they believe mm -hmm. in their dream. Other people in the same situation, their conversation will be about, it's so challenging right now. I'm really having a struggling time. The economy, the this, the competition, right. the that. And, you know, what you think about, you bring about. So mindset prophecy. truly can be the most powerful ingredient in bringing about success. So your organization, Networking for Empowering Women, mm -hmm. what exactly do you offer then? It's well, it's very specific. It's a professional membership association that supports women entrepreneurs in business, personal, financial, and also spiritual fulfillment. It's got to be well-rounded. Mm -hmm. We offer a membership program that has well over $4,000 in member benefits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it changes people's lives, literally. We also have seminars that we do, one-day events, where we bring in different experts, sales and marketing, and how to get published and how to get publicity for your business. And we offer teleclasses. We have a free newsletter that goes out to thousands of women worldwide. And we have local networking meetings in here in the yeah. Southern California area. So, so uh, you're kind of busy. Yeah, <laughs> kind of busy. You're really I take busy. my five minutes in the morning, <laughs> good, 10 usually, good. Take time if not yourself. more. That's good. Yeah. Thank you so much. Great information. We really you're appreciate welcome. it. And we'll tell you how to get in touch with Christine Closer and the Network for Empowering Women right after this break. Stick around. where small business is the big idea. Making it is being brought to you by Sempra Energy, a Fortune 500 energy services company committed to building a diverse supplier base. By Honda, the power of dreams. And by the Hilton family of hotels. Whether your travel plans are for business or pleasure, the Hilton family offers you a choice of fine accommodations in prime locations around the world. Welcome back. You can reach Christine Closer at her email address, ck at newentrepreneurs.com. And if you'd like to send us an email, send it to info at makingittv.com. And you can also purchase a copy of today's show on our website at www.makingittv.com. And there you can also tap into a number of business resources. Well, that's our show for this week. I'm Lynette Romero. And I'm Emmett Miller, in for Larry McCormick. Thanks for joining us. See you next time. I have... Um, the ability to be there when my kids absolutely need me. And that is what gives you the gratification of being able to be, you know, a good parent at the same time, you know that that means that you'll be up at two in the morning and working weekends um, in order to be able to, uh, to have a good business. How does a business grow? Hello, I'm Nelson Davis, executive producer of Making It. In today's show, we answer that question by posing another. How does a garden grow? Because the entrepreneurs we're showcasing are nurturing their businesses with a little help from Mother Nature and a lot of sweat of the brow. It seems pretty elemental, really. The sun, the earth, water, and seeds combined in the right hands can make a real business. But of course, into every garden, a little rain must fall. And we'll see how these green thumbs weathered the storms up next on Making It. Making It Minority Success Stories. 
Inspiring personal stories of struggle, triumph, and success from America's small business community. Anderson sitting in for Lynette Romero. And I'm Emmett Miller in for Larry McCormick. Chances are, either you or someone you know is involved in gardening, because the latest figures show that it's an activity enjoyed by 79% of all U.S. households. Each of those 85 million homes spend about $466 annually. That makes lawn and gardening a $40 billion a year industry. Jimmy Williams may not have known those figures, but he did know that growing flowers and vegetables was in his soul, his heritage began with his grandmother's grandmother, who smuggled prized tomato seeds in her pocket when she left the Caribbean. Today, those Goose Creek heirloom tomatoes are one of his company's best sellers, along with thousands of other varieties of fruits, vegetables, and herbs. When Jimmy started Hayground Organic Gardening eight years ago, he had the seeds, but he didn't have the seed money. Xiomara Galindo explains how Jimmy went from designing sportswear in Manhattan to creating a blossoming business in his own backyard. So you have seedlings that you grow up here? Most of them are growing right up on this rooftop, yeah. Right on the rooftop. You have made the most of all your space here, Jimmy. We sell our seedlings, of course, and then we do garden design for um, any type of garden design, whether it's rock work or retaining walls or plant, uh, vegetable gardens, uh, stack stone gardens raised bed gardens, anything like that we do. You come from a long line of gardeners. Tell us about your family history with gardening. Well, I guess I started when I was about six years old, uh, living with my grandmother uh, back east. And I've been gardening that many years. I don't want to tell you how many years, <laughs> but it's about 50 some years. I understand that you actually have a patent pending on the Goose Creek heirloom tomato, which actually came from your grandmother. Tell us about that. It goes back to Charleston, South Carolina, which is where the first uh, Caribbean and West African slaves came to this country. And they're called Gullah people, or Geechees. That tomato was only grown by our family. And, and they, they don't know whether it came over with them or they started growing it when they came over. But um, my grandmother says that she, it came over with, with her grandmother. So that's how far back that goes. What lessons did your grandmother hand down to you that you still incorporate to this day in your gardening? She always had a compost pile, and it, it usually was like a big open pit, and all your, you know, your grass clippings and your dry leaves and everything went into that hole. So and whenever we needed some fertilizer, we would just go, she would say, oh, go get me a bucket of compost, and we'd bring it over and put it around the tomato plants, and that, that's the best uh, fertilizer you can get. You were once a very successful sportswear designer. Why did you give all that up and turn your passion of gardening into a business? Well, I think I was, I was kind of motivated by a friend of mine back east, uh, Sandy Summers, who's a writer. And the first gardener I ever did was a rooftop garden in Manhattan. And it was her garden. And she's the one that encouraged me. She said, Jimmy, you ought to you know, go into this business. And I said, oh, I think I want to do that, you know, designing clothing. And she said, did you log all your information about all the different varieties you grew? I said, yeah. She said, why don't you do a catalog? I said, well, I don't know how to do a catalog. She said, well, give me the information. I'll do your first catalog. So she was the one that did the first catalog. You started your business very humbly. You didn't have a car, and you found a very interesting mode of transportation to get to your clients. Tell us that story. I didn't want to tell clients I didn't have a vehicle, right? And none of them really knew until I after, way after I told them, they always thought I had a vehicle. I'd get on the bus, right? And I would go from here to Venice, from Venice to the valley. So everybody automatically assumed I had a car. But I would get on the bus with a bag of plants, some tools, and uh, most of the clients had their own tools too, so I didn't have to carry large tools. But that, that's how I did it until, until I had enough money to buy a vehicle. What is the more lucrative part of the business, the seedlings or the landscaping? Ironically enough, everything works off of the plants. For instance, when we do the Hollywood market, 
it's, we usually get two to three garden design offers per month from selling the plants at the farmer's market. That's how it happens. You now have 13 employees, a van, and can be found at Hollywood Farmer's Market on the weekends. Where is your business today? I think every small business when they experience growth, it, the problem is, is finding, is training people. And it's difficult to take the time and train people when you're right in the middle of your busy season. I think that that's a real problem that we have. So it just, it just takes a, a lot of time to do that. So now we're at the point where we actually have to turn people away and say we, we have no time or we have to put them off six months later, eight months later, which is kind of a good position to be in. Well, we do realize we need more space. Um, we've um, done a little research on our greenhouse, greenhouses, and we're looking at getting two 96 by 30 greenhouses, but we need the area to grow, to put them in. Each greenhouse is about $28,000. Uh, fully equipped. The land itself is, is about 250000 So I said we're looking at it. We're not ready to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> what advice would you give to people who are thinking about turning their own passion into a business? You have to give it time to evolve. Too. I mean, a lot of people don't have patience, so you got to be patient. That's got to be the greatest thing in the world, to like what you do and to make money at it. And a, a lot of people are starting to do that now. I noticed that. They're saying, well, I'm tired of the stock business. I'm tired of this. I want to do something I like. And I, 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 I'd encourage anybody to do that because you're probably going to do it the rest of your life if you like it. You know, that's got to be the key. It's his passion. Wow, get in the bus to take care of garden jobs. That's amazing. <laughs> Jimmy has designed gardens ranging from three acres with 80 different fruit trees to tiny yards the size of a studio apartment. He and his staff also will maintain their clients' gardens on a weekly or bi-weekly basis. And by feeding others through the fruits of his labor, Jimmy discovered that this is feeding his own soul. In Secrets of Success, Belma Johnson, the author of What Do You Dream?, says if you want to achieve your dreams, you first have to figure out how it's going to serve others. Whenever I do workshops about how to turn a dream into a business, people always can tell me a lot about their dream and not so much about how it could be a business. In other words, they know what serves them, the dream, but they don't know how to serve others, the business. For instance, I love books. I love to write them. I love to read them. I love to be around them. I love to spend all day with books. Now, how do I turn that dream into a business? By starting a publishing company. So, a publishing company serves not only the booksellers, bookstores, but also it serves eventually the end user or the customer, the reading public. And so that's how I turn my dream into a business, and that's the key. You have to ask yourself two questions. One, what do you dream? What serves you? What feeds your soul? What would you do for free? What would you do 24-7 and not even mind it? That's the dream. Then, how do I turn that into a business? How do I serve others? Who's the customer? Who am I helping? It's the combination of those two questions. What do you dream and who can you serve? And if you want to know more about following your own dreams, you can contact motivational speaker Belma Johnson. His website is at www.belmaj.com. And if you're interested in other secrets of success, log on to our website, www.makingittv.com. Coming up, how can a dying business survive and thrive? We'll meet Cindy and David Turk, who turned a decaying flower shop into the sweet smell of success. Stay with us. America's most lauded small business television show, Making It, is being brought to you by Honda, the power of dreams, and Sempra Energy, a Fortune 500 energy services company committed to building a diverse supplier base. Amen to that. I'll say Welcome back to Making It. Today we're talking to entrepreneurs who are growing their own business, literally, by growing their own business. For every example, each year the U.S. produces $420 million worth of cut flowers, two-thirds of them coming from California. Our next entrepreneurs own two of the 24,000 floral shops that sell them. Ten years ago, Cindy and David Turk were a young married couple looking forward to a bright future. They were expecting their first baby, and Cindy was planning to quit her job to become a stay-at-home mom. David made a good living as a construction worker, but he suffered a major blow when all his tools were stolen from his truck. That very same day, a friend called and told him 
that there was a flower shop for sale. David had grown up in the floral industry, so the couple jumped at it. They jumped at this chance to own their own business. They quickly refinanced their home to make the purchase, but unfortunately, as they were soon to learn, they should have looked more carefully before they leaped. Too late, they found out the store was doing terrible business. And to make matters worse, the building was completely infested with termites. So piece by piece, David used his skills to rebuild the foundation while Cindy learned how to arrange flowers from her mother-in-law. Every cent they made in the very beginning had to go right back into keeping that business up and running. Lynette Romero has the story. My family's been in the flower business since I was born. And so I, I, I had my first little flower stand myself when I was about 10 or 11 out every weekend on a roadside out by Rio Hondo College. And so I really learned as I was growing up the whole business. And was, once Cindy and I decided to get our own store, my dad really helped us with, with purchasing and taking us around, introducing us to the wholesalers, telling us what flowers to buy, what's going to last. And my mom, she, she's always had a full service flower shop. And so she really helped us with just learning how to handle the customers and making the arrangements and, and doing the, and just the general bookkeeping and the different aspects of running the store. It was 1995. Newly married David and Cindy always knew they wanted to own a business and they were willing to take the risk, even though they had a baby. They took out a second mortgage, quit their jobs, and bought a flower shop. But they had a devastating surprise after signing the papers to buy the company. We didn't realize that it was, um, that it had a poor reputation as well as the business was, the building facility was termite infested. and and it had just a lot of problems, so we had to almost start over again. The store was very weathered because of the beach. We had no love and attention, we had to bring it. We knew the remodel would have to happen, but it was a slow process. It was tough, you know, it was a lot of work, a lot of work. The store had few clients. Cindy had no flower arranging experience, yet they managed to rebuild and even surpass the old standards. Here at Devon's Garden, we do fresh floral arrangements, um, custom gift baskets, fresh floral and plant baskets, as well as um, decorating people's homes, corporate accounts, um, hotels, restaurants, anything that you really need your floral needs for in any part of the business. Every arrangement that leaves here, we really attend and make sure that each piece is something that we value and that really keeps the standards up. She and David split the day-to-day -day operations of the business. David does all the flower buying, all the plant buying, and I do um, the arranging as well as the managerial duties that are acquired, all the business aspect of it. I just kind of buy on quantity. I can, you know, as I'm, as I'm picking out the bulk flowers, I can kind of feel where we need to be as far as the, the quantity the store is going to need. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that's just like a restaurant. If it's, if it's over four or five days old here at the store, we have to, we have to throw it away. We actually had to enclose our trash can to keep the neighbors and different people <laughs> sorry, from digging through it. Because we would throw away stuff that would look just fine to you, but we, we, we're not able to send anything out on orders that's not going to last you five to seven days. Cindy learned flower arranging from other people, including their employees. She says they've got to stay on the cutting edge to succeed. I think the greatest challenge is staying on top of, staying on top of what's going on around you, the, the different trends that are happening and making sure that you are on top of it and trying to um, trying to make sure that everything in the shops are always up to par and always extremely beautiful and making sure that the employees are happy. They've grown the business and expanded to a second location. They've added a home decorating service for special events, but their bread and butter remains. The walk-in, the day the day business, the, every customer that walks in and walks out, that's the biggest part of the business. Um, the corporate accounts then second follow, which mean all the doctors and the all the offices, the lobby arrangements, the hotels. Um, that's a great business because it's, it's weekly. After that, the weddings, um, the parties, the big parties, events, that's probably third. But most of all, it's, it's the person that walks in and just wants a $10 bouquet and then the, the $50 basket for their girlfriend or an anniversary. That really is the bulk of your business here. Because some deem flowers as a luxury, florists can suffer severe financial setbacks in a down economy. Well, after 9-11, the first thing to leave was um, the flowers. The hotels said, you know, we need to cut back. Um, the restaurants said, we, the bud bases need to leave. Um, so we really focused on the customers. That the anniversaries were never going to leave. The birthdays were never going to leave. Making sure that you really took care of the customers that walked in. And that, since it is the bulk of our business, we really concentrated on that. I think whenever you have a, a big crisis like that, 
if you're if you stay focused on what you do and what you love and you s still maintain an excellent product, the business will always turn around. Beautiful work. Oh, yeah. It's tough to do well in that business, too, let me tell you. Cindy says one of the biggest challenges facing their business right now is the competition from the big chain grocery stores. She says even though people think that florists are more expensive in most cases, she can beat those supermarket prices. Up next, Mark Robertson, the president of Pacific Coast Regional Small Business Development Corporation. He's here in our studio. He'll discuss the tools every good entrepreneur needs for growing their business. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Making It. Here's how you can contact today's entrepreneurs. You can call Jimmy Williams of Hayground Organic Gardening at 323-216-0379 to contact Cindy and David Turk of Devon's Gardens. Call 562-592-2610. And now let's join Gail in the studio with Mark Robertson. Mr. Robertson is the president and CEO of Pacific Coast Regional Small Business Development Corporation. Gail. Thank you, Emmett. Mark Robinson worked as a commercial banker for dozens of years before joining PCR. For the past 12 years, he's been involved with PCR by providing financial and educational assistance to local small businesses. Mark, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. Now, you have a course at your organization entitled A Quantum Leap of Success. Now, let's talk about the class a little bit and why you think this is an important step for business growth. Well, a, qu a quantum leap for success is a uh, one of a series of classes that we have and the primary focus of that class is to motivate our students uh, and get them really pumped up uh, to meeting their goals for growing their businesses. Um, it's important for them to take into consideration some of the sacrifices that they'll be making in taking on business growth. Um, they need to understand that there'll be less time with fa family, there'll be less leisure time, vacations may be infrequent. Uh, they may not even have time to get sick uh, if, if their growth <laughs> plan goes the way that they want it to, to go. So they need to look at their, their current business and see whether or not their growth will affect the morale of their employees, whether, whether or not it will affect their current level of customer service, customer service quality. All these things need to be taken into consideration from a, a, a qualitative standpoint and understanding is bigger really better. Oh, dose of reality before you make the, make the next move. All right. Now, it's important to put um, a growth plan on paper for a business owner. Now, what's the significance of the business plan during the expansion phase? Well, the, the business plan in, in uh, the, the growth plan portion of the business plan is simply a matter of updating or revising the original business plan that they did when they, uh, that hopefully they did when they started their businesses. Mm -hmm. The growth plan should uh, um, uh, allow them to basically have a concrete, a tangible item that they can follow as a map to meet their goals of growth. Uh, in coming here today, if I didn't know where I was going, I'd have to pull a map to get here. I have an idea of what 5800 Sunset is, but if I didn't know, I'd need a map. Same thing with a growth plan. You need to map out where you're going. So uh, they need to understand the costs associated with it, both uh, the initial cost of, of growing the business and the ongoing cost that will result as a re result of that growth. Interesting. Now, let's talk about the money. Um, what does an entrepreneur need to know about financing growth? Well, there are several things they need to know. First of all, and I mentioned cost, they need to know what it's going to, co to cost to bring on those new employees, uh, bring in a new piece of equipment. Uh, obtain uh, new space if, if that's required. They need to know how much of that cost they can finance uh, themselves out of their own funds that they've been able to, to accumulate. Third, they need to, if they're going to approach a lender, they need to be able to tell that lender how much they need to borrow. Fourth, they need to understand uh, and be able to share with the lender exactly what they're going to do with the funds. And finally, they need to be able to share with the lender uh, when and how the funds will be paid back. And you also say increasing uh, a growing business's marketing is important. How do you increase the visibility? Well, there, there are many ways to, uh, uh, to make a business visible in the marketplace. Some use print media, radio, television, uh, mass mailers. Uh, but a, a, a good way to increase visibility, visibility is by creating a website. And in doing that, uh, businesses want to visit 
successful websites of, of competitors, whether large or small, and see what makes their website successful. Uh, is it uh, the, uh, the, uh, the number of products they have on display? Was the, the site easy to find? Is it easy to use once, once they get there? And in, in doing that, they'll see what makes that particular business successful on the internet and they'll be able to come up with some ideas for creating that much more vi visibility for their own businesses. And of course this means hiring more staff. How do you handle employee relations? Well, uh, I think in one of your er earlier segments, Mr. Williams mentioned um, that his business growth is necessitating bringing on more staff. It's important for he and any other business that's growing uh, to understand all of the, uh, the, the laws related to proper employment practices, minimum wage laws, uh, uh, health and safety, uh, properly documenting um, uh, hours worked, uh, sick time, all those things need to be taken into consideration because if they're not, the business owner could be letting themselves in for legal issues Ooh. from the employee standpoint as well as uh, sanctions or fines from Ooh. governmental agencies. Interesting. So, and, and if they don't have a person that's adept uh, on their team at Human Relations Issues, the California Employment Development De Department can help with that. Excellent. Thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. All right, we'll tell you how to reach Mark Robertson and the Pacific Coast Regional Small Business Development Co Corporation right after this break. Where small business is the big idea, making it is being brought to you by the Boeing Company, and by the Hilton Family of Hotels. Whether your travel plans are for business or pleasure, the Hilton Family offers you a choice of fine accommodations in prime locations around the world. To reach Mark Robertson at Pacific Coast Regional Small Business Development Corporation, call 213-739-2999, extension 222. And if you'd like to send us an email, send it to info at makingittv.com. Make sure to visit our website as well, www.makingittv.com. And there you can find a list of small business resources and you can learn how to submit stories to our show. I love the theme of today's show, flowers, gardening, and the way we care for those items. We also have to take care of the business of gardening and and all that sort of stuff the same way. We have to fertilize it and watch it and nurture it. And make sure what, what we put out is the best product. Water and, and we'll keep growing for other people. That's, exactly. that's the, you know, the sort exactly. of a necessary theme here. Very and nice that's for it spring. for this week. I think so as well. Nice for spring. Okay. I'm Emmett Miller sitting in for Larry McCormick. I'm Gail Anderson in for Lynette Romero. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you here next time on Making It. So many, many different varieties. For instance, that's Pink accordion. a... accordion. Pink accordion. That is probably one of the prettiest tomatoes, and it also tastes good. But this.